Welcome to the Slide Rule Survival Channel, where we talk about how to make mechanical computations using the slide rule. A question that you might ask yourself is why the slide rule? Well, the slide rule is a tool that has a lot of great advantages for even the newest user. Among those advantages would be the fact that a slide rule needs no batteries, a slide rule is relatively simple to use once you decode how the scales and the cursor work, and the slide rule is very, very convenient as shown with the small pocket size rule I have on the table. Slide rules can do lots of interesting computations. Once you learn how to operate it, it does require a knowledge of math, and it does require you to have reduced the problem in such a way to make it easy for you to use on the rule, which you don't have to do when you use a calculator. However, a slide rule will force you to focus on the math, and then the slide rule simply performs the mechanics to make the math work for you. In essence, a slide rule is nothing more than a mechanical and logarithmic scale that we can manipulate to give us a certain output given certain inputs. Typically, you work on a total of two uh, sets of digits at a time to make it work. Today's video is going to focus primarily on the very simple terminology that we're going to use as we work with the slide rule. To start with, this is what we call a duplex rule. A duplex rule is a rule where we have what we'll call scales on both sides of the rule. On this particular rule, the scales are denoted with letters going from the top to the bottom. Most of the times, the scale letters were placed on the left-hand side of the rule, but that is not always the case as it differed from manufacturer. A duplex rule is one in which we have scales, as shown here, on the left-hand side, and then if we turn it over, we will have a different set of scales on this side that do different things. So that's an example of a duplex rule. It's one of the most common things that you'll find in some medium to high end type of slide rules. The second thing that we want to discuss is we want to talk about what is the body of the rule. The body of the rule are these two fixed pieces that do not move. They uh, are then manipulated with the next piece we're going to talk about, which is the slide. It moves from left to right, as shown here, or conversely, we can go from right to left. On this slide, the next piece that you'll hear people talk about is the runner, and the runner is a piece that can move from side to side like this. Inside the runner is a hairline, which I'm going to pick up and show more detailed in the camera. The hairline is put over the digit of interest. What we're going to talk about next is the basic scales that one might show on a rule. In essence, what you're going to notice about a slide rule is that it has different scales on it to perform what we'll call different functions. So in basic math, we have what we'll call a rule. So as an example, if we have a value y, and then we have on the other side of our equal sign 2 multiplied by x, we've created a function that says Every time you see x, you multiply it by 2, and that will give you an output y. So if you think about it, a function is nothing more than a machine. I give it an input, 
in X, I create an output in Y. Right? As such, what the slide rule allows us to do is to make computations in such a manner as that we can actually perform even a what if scenario with the slide rule. We'll get into that in later videos. For right now, let us suffice it to say that we have some basic types of scales, which I'm going to kind of go over very quickly. The two most basic scales that you'll see are the C and the D scales. They stand for the two items that we're going to manipulate. The two most basic computations on a slide rule are multiplication and division. In multiplication, what we're doing is we're adding the logarithm representation of the two numbers of interest and then figuring out what the product is. Since in mathematics many things come in pairs and two things can be duals of each other, you might not be surprised to know that division represents a case where what we're doing is we subtract the logarithms of two numbers. And in essence, why a slide rule is so powerful is because it allows us to represent a very wide range of numbers because as you look at the slide rule, what you'll see is that as we go from the left-hand side of the rule to the right-hand side of the rule, what you'll notice is that the tick marks, which represent various numbers along the number line, get spaced smaller and smaller, closer and closer together. Why? Because this scale is not a linear scale, but it's actually a logarithmic scale. And that's the reason why we can use the slide rule very conveniently to do lots of operations. So, to review, on very basic slide rules, one will have the C and the D scale. After C and D, a lot of times manufacturers would place the inverse, and inverses are typically always done with red lettering, and whereas C and D will go numerically greater, going from left to right, the inverse scale works in the opposite way, in that we start with our numbers and they go from right to left. So this is the smallest number and that's the largest number. You'll note on this particular slide rule, but this is not always the case, is that even when I'm increasing from left to right, the numbers on the end are called indices and it turns out that this number might represent the smallest index called the left index. This number here, though it's numbered one, is the largest index. And that number could be 10. It could be any number we want it to be. A principal thing you have to remember with a slide rule is that it doesn't place the decimal point for you. You have to have sort of a sense of what the number is. Why the slide rule is such a valuable learning tool is because of the fact that the slide rule itself forces you to sort of say sanity check your answer. Once again, getting back to some basic understanding of math facts is very, very important to use a slide rule. So we've talked about C and D, again, going from left to right. And as you take a careful look, you will see on this particular rule that between one and two, you have a fairly good idea as what the tick marks represent in terms of the interval between the lines. If I were to move the same rule over a little bit and now cutting off the left hand side of the scale and only showing the right hand side, what you're going to notice is that the rule itself, you can see that the spacing between tick marks gets smaller and smaller and smaller and that's the logarithmic feature I was talking about. So, basic scale functions, again, represented by letters, are things like square, square root, cube, cube root, trigonometric functions, in this case represented by sine and tangent, and for small angles below 
let's call it about 5.5 degrees, we have a small angle scale called sine tangent. So in essence, what you're doing is these various things represent for us the various values of that. Okay, so we've shown on this particular side of a slide rule the trigonometric functions, S for sine, in this case sine and tangent for small angle values, and the tangent if I want to find the tangent of a number. Um, so that's the key pieces for trigonometric type of functions. There's a couple of other functions that are related to this this scale here is called the P function, otherwise known as the Pythagorean function. That is for right angle type of computations, and we will talk about that more later. Some other basic things that were put in for your convenience are what we call the folded scales. In this case, this particular rule has two folded scales. This one here is called CF and DF, and what that allows us to do is that allows us to multiply a number by pi. So in essence, this rule is calibrated, if you will, centered around pi. So that's how that works. Finally, another thing that was put on for your convenience is the CIF scale when I want to divide a certain number by pi. So that comprises some very basic functions that you'll see on most medium to high end slide rules. Let's turn the slide rule over and as we turn it over we're now going to see a different set of scales. Typically they'll always include C and D or either D by itself or C by itself depending upon how the rule is laid out. Again every manufacturer is different. And then here's an example of working with square root A and B and going further down, this is an example of cube root. Let's say many times in nature, we want to um, figure out exponential rate of growth or decay. Well, that is why the scales LL1, 2, and 3 were developed. The ones in black, again, are read from left to right. And if you take a look at these top scales, again, these are inverse functions of the transcendental number E, and you'll see that on this side of the rule. So those are some very basic things that you'll see that are common to slide rules. Now, I should point out that not everybody uses the designators A and B in terms of working with squares and square roots. That sometimes can change from manufacturer. The other thing that is often found on slide rules are things called gauge marks. These are convenient things that you might have to do some common type of computational things that you'll need. As an example, if we're working um, in calculus, many times when we work with trigonometric functions, we want to convert from degrees to radians. Let's say, uh, as another example, we might want to go from radians to degrees area to diameter or diameter to area might be other things we might want to compute. So manufacturers might put certain constants and if you multiply or divide by that constant you can obtain very quickly with very little effort on your part the value that you desire. Some other types of things that you might see on a cursor might be special markings, things like kilowatts, and then if you know kilowatts, you can convert easily to horsepower right on the rule. Sometimes they'll include a factor like 3.6 can be when I want to convert from, let's say, hours to minutes and so forth. Some rules also even include an actual ruler, which is basically to measure linear distance in either centimeters or inches. That's common uh, on some lower end rules that you might see where it does a little bit of everything. As far as materials of construction, rules vary widely in what they're made of. Some of them are all plastic. Some of them are plastic and metal together. 
Some of them are wood, and then the scales themselves were done in a sort of celluloid. And it really kind of depended upon what the manufacturer was aiming for. The size of the rule I've shown on the table is a slide rule that is a five or six inch slide rule. Uh, typically, if one wanted a little bit more precision in setting a number, they might use a 12 inch or 20 inch slide rule. And we'll get into differences between the terms accuracy and precision in other videos. So we talked about that. Uh, in our case, we will have a video later on that can be looked at in terms of our evaluation of a slide rule, right? How would one evaluate a slide rule? Well, one might look at the number of scales on the rule. One might look at how easy it is to read or understand the scale. A lot of times on European rules, what was used was they might show the letter on the left-hand side of the rule, and on the right-hand side of the rule, they'll show you the function corresponding to that letter. And turning the rule over, you'll see that the same basic idea is repeated on this side of the rule. So that gives you, so to say, a very, very basic idea of the slide rule. To go into a quick example of how the slide rule might be used is what we're going to do is we're going to illustrate and tie together some basic points to keep your interest. Let's say I want to multiply 2 multiplied by 2. Well, what I can do is I can take my left index, put it under the 2 here, then let's see if we can figure out our answer. We already know the answer if we know our math facts, but you'll understand the power of the slide rule once I go through this with you. So I take my left index, so in essence, I'm adding logarithmically the value 2 here, and now what I want to do is I'm going to now take my cursor, put it over the second number I want to multiply by, so here's the first number of 2. That is what sets 2 as the first factor. And the second factor is the number I want to multiply by is 2. And if we look under the hairline, we'll see the number 4. Why is that important? Because once I set my factor of 2, it doesn't really matter what else I want to multiply by. So as a simple example, if I wanted to multiply and I just couldn't figure it out right away, by the factor of 1.5, I'm going to move my cursor over. And what you're going to see is that I fall right over the number 3. And similarly, if I wanted to, I could pick any other number I desire. Let's go on, say I'm going to go to 2.5. And again, I haven't shown you how to read how the tick marks are set up. But let's call this 2.5. How do I get that? Because that tick mark is midway between 2 here and 3 here. That's 2.5, and you'll notice it's on 5. But again, I could set it to any, almost any random value I wanted if I know what the value of each of the tick marks is, and then I know where I can find my corresponding answer with some confidence. Now, why is that important? That's important because basically, I now can play out a lot of what-if scenarios just by understanding how to read the slide rule. And that's a very, very powerful function for you. And if you think about it, in essence, it's like a mechanical spreadsheet. That's basically what you've done, right? So if, let's say, you know the one factor, but now I, I'll, I'll just arbitrarily set it, let's say, to this factor here, well, that'll give me some idea if I know, again, what the value of that particular tick mark is that's under the hairline, I then can correspondingly figure out what the answer is by looking at this, which is, in this case, on the D scale, right, which is back here. So that just gives you a kind of brief overview as to how the slide rule is very powerful. Now, again, here what we did, and this is just a concept I want you to remember, is I'm adding logarithmically lengths, right? If, again, I'm going and doing division, I'm subtracting one length from the other. 
So I'm not going to show that in this video. We'll show that at a different point, but this just gives you an idea of how this can be used to set up that. And conversely, if I was doing division, once I set one proportion, I can now compute all sorts of other proportions if the two relationships are linear. So that's the reason why a slide rule can be a very, very powerful thing. That concludes our basic introduction to the slide rule. So to review one more time, and we're just going to reset this back. This is called the slide, which will move left to right or right to left, depending upon what type of computation I'm doing. The fixed piece is the body that surrounds the slide. This piece here is the runner, and it can move any way you want it to go. When we want to set an answer or we're looking for something, we set the number of interest underneath this piece on the runner, or it's also called the cursor, called the hairline. And you'll often hear me use the term slide, runner, slide, or maybe slide, cursor, slide. So that's why I'm introducing that terminology. The letters on the left-hand side give us an idea as to what the function is. You have to go and consult with your manufacturer literature to tell you exactly what it is. Generally speaking, most people always use T for tangent. Most people always use ST to mean small angles of sine or tangent. C and D are always just values that we have as basic inputs. S is always sine. Everything else, unfortunately, is sort of up for grabs based on what the manufacturer tells you. This brings to mind a very basic and fundamental point. If one is to buy a slide rule, the very first question you should ask is, am I able to get the slide rule with the instructions in my native language so that I can figure out how to use the slide rule? That's very, very important. And just because you can get a slide rule manual with the slide rule that you're buying or you're trading, the bottom line is sometimes the examples don't always illustrate the point. So you have to kind of play around with it a little bit to understand how this works. And it does take a little bit of practice and a little bit of persistence, but you can do it. I hope this has been illuminating and fun for you. It certainly was fun for me to record it. And we'll see you again next time.